Good afternoon, everyone. So with me today, to my right, a very familiar face from the Department of Health, the state's epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tan. Tina, great to have you with us. To my left, uh, a guy who needs no introduction, the superintendent of the state police, Colonel Pat Callahan. By the way, Pat, given you're in charge of weather, just this just in, it's raining quite heavily out there. I'm uh, still drying off. We also have Jared Maples, uh, Director of the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness, Chief Counsel Paramel Garg, a cast of thousands. I think you were there as well. I know Judy is not with us today because um, she was at Terry Mulcahy's uh, funeral. Um, uh, the wife of Bob Mulcahy, a guy known to many in the state, was Brendan Burns, Chief of Staff, Chair of the CRDA, was uh, Athletic Director at Rutgers, Mayor of Mendham, and uh, Terry was right beside Bob every step of the way, whether it was in Mendham, uh, in Morris County, or in any number of activities in the state. Terry passed, uh, I guess, Friday or Saturday. Um, and keep her and Bob and their family in your prayers. I spoke to Bob on Saturday, and she was quite a woman. Um, we covered a lot on Monday, so to everyone's relief today, this will be a much briefer uh, briefing. A couple of uh, points before we jump into the meat of the matter. I had a very good conversation this morning with the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, former governor of Michigan, and talked to, uh, about a lot of the common ground we have with the federal initiatives and spent a considerable amount of time on offshore wind in particular, uh, where I reiterated our aspiration, and she's extremely happy to hear this, uh, to be a leader. Uh, not just in this country, but to be a global leader in offshore wind, including the making of some of the supply chain, uh, if not a lot of the supply chain right here in New Jersey. Uh, it was a really good conversation. And on a lighter note, uh, Tammy and I, with friends, including uh, Mayor Reed Gassiora right here from Trenton, were at the opening Trenton Thunder game last night, which is a big deal. Um, first, it was the first game ever in the history of the Worcester Red Sox. They moved from Pawtucket, where they've been for decades, and this was their first game. More immediately and more importantly, uh, the Trenton Thunder are now the AAA affiliate for the Toronto Blue Jays. So this is the first AAA baseball game in, the, in Trenton's history. It's the first AAA game, Pat, we asked, we believe in 70 years in New Jersey. Um, we, I think the, the connection with Jersey City had a New York Giants um, connection uh, at the time. And it's funny how life works. Uh, the Yankees made the decision to move from Trenton to Somerset with their double-A team. And of course, we lost Steve Califer uh, a week and a half ago, who owns the Somerset team. Uh, and the Trenton Thunder were going to be part of a non-affiliated, undrafted league, which was still a high-quality alternative. Uh, but the, guess what? The Canadian government is not allowing teams to travel back and forth over the border due to COVID. So their AAA franchise in Buffalo is where the Blue Jays are going to move up from Florida to play their major league games. And the Buffalo Bisons were looking for a home. And Trenton rolled out their red carpet, and it was a magical night. Trenton won. Uh, and it was really special uh, to get baseball back uh, in Trenton and get AAA baseball back in New Jersey. Okay, with that, several updates. First of all, the current ban on interstate indoor youth sports competitions, which is still on actually, is going to be lifted on the same day, May 19th, when we take a bunch of steps forward that we enumerated on Monday. Next up, one of our continual focuses over the past months has been to get our school students and educators and staff back into their buildings for in-person instruction. Over the past eight weeks, we've seen these efforts kick into high gear across the state. Just think about this for a second. At the beginning of March, this is only two months ago, the number of districts holding to an all remote schedule was 142, or that was nearly one in five of all public school districts, uh, charter, renaissance schools, special services schools. Today, that number is not 142, it's now down to 16. And that 16 breaks down as following. Seven are charter schools, so single charter schools. Five are regular operating public school districts. I'll come back to that in a minute. And four are special services schools. So again, of the 16, five are districts, which are multiple buildings and schools in each of those categories. And then you've got 11 single 
schools, either charter or special services. Our goal is to get these 16 down to zero and for these roughly 53,000 students and their educators to be back in their classrooms for in-person instruction. Of the five regular operating districts still on all remote learning, and I want to make sure uh, we say who they are, Hillside, Irvington, Passaic, Patterson, and Pleasantville, Hillside and Irvington have set a target date for returning to either all in-person or hybrid instruction, which would begin uh, on May 24th for both. That would bring roughly 10,000 students back into school, and we applaud Hillside and Irvington for making those plans. I, I spoke with the president of the Board of Ed, I guess, yesterday at Hillside. I gave a shout out to Senator Joe Cryan, who's been very helpful. We know that there are a myriad reasons why the remaining districts have not taken this step, but the simple fact remains that we cannot leave 43,000 of our students, as well as thousands of educators and staff, out of their classrooms for an entire year. That's not fair to them, their families, their communities, or their futures. We will continue to work with these schools through the Department of Education and alongside local leaders and stakeholders to move this along. And we continue to work with the districts currently in a hybrid stance or in person for certain grades or buildings to increase opportunities for in person instruction across the board, including being able to get to a full school day. Next up, for homebound New Jerseyans, county areas on aging, and those are the offices tasked by the Department of Human Services to support seniors in their communities. Uh, those areas of aging, uh, of aging offices have been coordinating with county health departments to identify those in need of vaccination and support these efforts. Through this collaboration, among, by the way, other collaborations, at least 7,000 homebound New Jerseyans have received in-home vaccination. And this number, by the way, does not count uh, those vaccinated at pop-up cl clinics held throughout the state in senior housing buildings. To supplement these efforts, the Department of Health, and Tina, I want to thank you and your colleagues, is allocating doses directly to home health agencies like the Visiting Nurses Association, the Visiting Nurse Associations to vaccinate the homebound. Many of our hospitals have also been working with their affiliated home care agencies to vaccinate folks in their homes. Individuals who have yet to be connected with their local health department or a home health agency and who need an in-home vaccination should visit that website, which is covid19.nj.gov slash homeboundvax, or call that number 855-568-0545, 855-568-0545, which of course is our call center. The Department of Health will follow up to assist in connecting you with a vaccine provider. Another resource for people who are homebound and any person with a disability for that matter is Register Ready, which is a free, secure, voluntary database for people with disabilities and functional needs who may need assistance. Local offices of emergency management have been using this registry to conduct wellness checks on homebound residents throughout this pandemic, and Pat, you know that well, and many health departments are using this list to help them with vaccination planning. To join Register Ready, text, you can see it there on the screen, Ready NJ to 899211. That's Ready NJ to 89, pardon me, 8982921. Let me start that again. Ready NJ to 898211. Or you could just call 211 directly for assistance. Finally, since Monday's announcement, many more craft brewers up and down the state have asked to be a part of our Shot in a Beer Vaccination Incentive Program. For the updated list of participating craft brewers, visit covid19.nj.gov slash shot and a beer. But these are the new ones, and I want to read them out because they deserve uh, to get a shout out. Um, I've got third, yeah, 13th Child Brewery, 13th Child Brewery, Alimentary Brewery, Angry Eric Brewing, Chimney Rustic Ales, 
Sigmeister Brewing, Death of the Fox Brewing Company, Departed Souls Brewing Company, Double Nickel Brewing Company, Dr. Brew Little's Beer Company, Eclipse Brewing, Eight and Sand Beer Co., Forgotten Boardwalk Brewing Company, Four City Brewing Company, Man Skirt Brewing, Montclair Brewery, Neck of the Woods Brewing Co., New Jersey Beer Co., Tuckahoe Brewing Co., United Brewing Co., Westville Brewery, and Zed's Beer. And don't forget, to claim your beer, you need to receive your first shot during the month of May. While we are thrilled by the positive reception we've gotten for the Shot in a Beer program, we are going full steam ahead on the entire outreach program we outlined on Monday, Operation Jersey Summer. We are not going to rest on any laurels. And by the way, this, importantly, in the Shot in the Beer list that's growing is an example of this. What we discussed on Monday is really just the floor of our efforts. We're going to be adding more components and more partnerships over the coming days and weeks. And everything we do, every component we add, and every partnership we build as part of Operation Jersey Summer will be on this strong foundation that we have set. This is all being done under, under a common theme, and that is for us to defeat this virus and get ourselves set for our future, we need a strong and healthy state. Public health creates economic health, and this push to ensure everyone has the ability to be vaccinated is our surest way to turn those words into reality. And with those updates, Tina, I'm going to jump into today's numbers with your blessing. We'll start, as we have of late, with the latest on our statewide vaccination program. As of this morning, the Department of Health has tallied a total of 3,210,158 New Jerseyans fully vaccinated through our program, representing a total of nearly 7.3 million administered doses. As I mentioned on money, Monday, the department has further identified now what is, we said 155,000 on Monday, the number has grown somewhat to 157,000 New Jersey residents who have been fully vaccinated through sites in other states. This brings the total of fully vaccinated residents to roughly 3.37 million, which means we're 72% of the way to our initial goal of 4.7 fully vaccinated New Jerseyans by the end of June. So let's keep our eye on the finish line. This is a marathon, and we have now passed, sort of by my mind's eye, the 20-mile mark, but it's always that last 6.2, having run one marathon uh, in my life, that the last 6.2 that is the biggest test and the hardest. Um, so let's keep to it, and let's get vaccinated. Today, and I know, Tina, you're going to get into this in more detail, we're reporting an additional 1,309 PCR and an additional 1,700 presumed positive antigen tests. Um, before anyone uh, uh, jumps uh, in reaction to this, this number is high as the Communicable Disease Service, which collects and reports this data, was informed yesterday of a processing error in which meant more than 2,650, Tina, I've got by my count, antigen test results, some dating back as far as October, were never previously reported or cross-checked. And again, Tina will get into this in a little bit more detail. The most important thing for us is that we're accurately reporting numbers, and we are. The statewide rate of transmission is at 0.34. I'm going to repeat what Judy and I said on Monday, which is we think this is still uh, lower than it in fact is because of the adjustment of the of the 10,000 cases we referred to just over a week ago. In any case, it is under one, it's meaningfully under one, and that's the most important part. Positivity rate for 16,908 PCR tests recorded last Saturday is 6.87% higher than we would like, but not any longer in the double digits that we were seeing consistently on every weekend test uh, day. Last night, our hospitals reported a total of 1,382 patients. 1,267 of them were confirmed COVID positive. Uh, ICU count is down to 314, and the number of ventilators in use is also down to 196. We saw 186 live patients leave our 71 hospitals yesterday. 149 were admitted. That's still too high, but a lot lower than it's been and our hospitals reported, again, not confirmed, 
13 in hospital deaths. <clears throat> However, today we are adding another 34 blessed souls to the list of those whose deaths are now confirmed to have been from COVID related complications. And the list of probable deaths has been adjusted and to today it is 2,640. This means we've now lost a total, if you add those numbers, of 25,707 residents over the past just 14 months. I mentioned World War II on Monday. We lost in World War II in four years 12,565 blessed brothers and sisters from our New Jersey community. Uh, the scale of that war was overwhelming. The scale of this war uh, remains so as well. Let's remember all those lives, those 12,565 and the 25,707 from this uh, extraordinarily challenging period in our state's history. Let's remember in particular three more of the blessed souls we have lost. First up today, we're going to begin by honoring the life of the woman on the right there, Anne-Marie Iavacola. Anne-Marie lived in the Williamstown section of Monroe Township in Gloucester County, and Anne-Marie was just 56 years old when she passed away two weeks ago. To know Anne-Marie was to know one thing for certain. More than anything else, she'd want to spend her day in a beach chair at the Jersey Shore, a book in hand, and family and friends by her side. And if she couldn't make it to the beach, she'd gladly sub in her dog, Marley. She and her, her husband, Richard, on the left, spent many a day like that. And she spent many an evening at a dinner table surrounded by her kids and brought her family where her, her infectious sense of humor and laugh would make anyone's troubles disappear. She now leaves Richard, uh, and she leaves him behind after 30 years, along with her twins, Kelly and Richie Jr., so that's Richard, Dad, and Kelly, and I had the great honor of speaking with each of them on Monday. I did not speak with Richie, but Richie also had suffered from COVID, and I asked after him and how he was doing, and they said he is still, quote unquote, dealing with it. Uh, this thing, depending on who you are and what, how it impacts you, is, it can be really crippling and it can stay with you. So we wish, wish Richie Jr. a speedy and complete recovery. Anne Marie is also survived by her mom and dad, Thomas and Barbara, and her brother Kevin, along with numerous nieces and nephews. May God bless Anne Marie. People what, wonder what makes New Jersey such a special place. Well, I will tell you one answer at the top of the list it's caring, humorous, giving people like that woman. May God bless and watch over her and her family. Next, we're going to move over to Kenilworth in Union County, which was the home for the past 30 years of that guy sitting in the middle, Stefan Kozicki, an immigrant from Poland, born in a historic lakeside resort town on the border with Slovakia. Stefan was a machinist at the Linden Mold and Tool Company of Rahway for 28 years. The true measure of the man and his was his family. His wife of 40 years, Janina, you could see her on the left. His three children, Renee, you could see her just to Stefan's left, and uh, Stephen and Joseph, and their spouses, Adam, Lindsay, and Dona, respectively. And his four grandkids, Grace, Gwen, Charlotte, and Olivia. For each of them, he would and could do anything, and he leaves them all behind. I had the great honor of speaking on Monday with Janina, his wife, and Renee, his daughter, and learned a lot about a great guy. He also leaves behind family back in his native Poland, including his brothers Jan and Franek, among numerous nieces, nephews, and cousins. Stefan, by the way, had just turned 65 years old when he passed. May God bless and watch over his memory and his family. Finally, we're going to stay in Union County, among its strong Polish community, to remember this guy, Janusz Masidlo of Union Township. He too was born in Poland and came to this country to find better opportunities. Janusz was a foreman at a machine shop, the perfect match for a man who was detailed oriented, loved to tinker, and could fix and create just about anything, whether it required his carpentry, electrical, or mechanical skills, 
or his intuition in the garden and in the kitchen. The patience he had with his work also poured out to family and friends. Janusz is survived by his wife, Teresa, who you could see with him, his children, Margaret, Robert, Dorothy, Dorothy's husband, Kevin, and his grandchildren, Savannah, Sonia, and Kyle. I had the great honor on Monday to speak with at least, it was a room full of people, I, at least in the room with Teresa, his wife and uh, children, Margaret, Robert, Dorothy, and his granddaughter, Savannah. One of the life lessons he instilled in his children was, and I quote Janusz, listen to those who want to speak to you. You will learn a lot about them, and at the same time, learn so much about yourself. Just listen and make sure you hear the words that are spoken to you. Good advice. And these words inspired each to find their calling in service. These are his three children. Margaret is a nurse. Robert is a member of the Union Fire Department. And Dorothy is a sergeant in the Union Police Department. Janusz also leaves two brothers back in Poland, Marian and Czeslow. He was 68 years old when he passed, and May 20th would have been his 69th birthday. We are honored that Janusz chose to make his home in New Jersey. May God bless and watch over his memory and his family. So let's not forget that even as we make real and significant strides toward the end of this pandemic, there are those who will not be with us when this war ends. And the best way we can honor their memories is by seeing this through. Now switch gears for a moment. Let's acknowledge another of the small business leaders who's making a difference in their community. This is Doris Baulas, who owns and operates De Vasquez Tax Solutions in the city of Garfield. But she does so much more than just help small businesses across Garfield and Passaic County file their taxes. Doris's mission is to help the entire small business community grow and prosper, with numerous clients hailing from low-income families and many with limited proficiency in English, Doris offers both a helping hand and an open ear. For the past year, she's helped her clients apply for PPE loans and grants, and she's helped many stay optimistic even in the darkest days. The city of Garfield, as we mentioned this here before, partnered with the Department of Community Affairs under Sheila Oliver's great leadership through their Neighborhood Preservation COVID-19 Relief Grant Program. And Doris was able to get a grant that allowed her not only to keep up with her rent and utilities when her doors were closed, but to upgrade the office and make it a safe and more comfortable place for her staff and clients when she reopened. Doris also became a sort of local ambassador to the Neighborhood Preservation Program, going door to door, business to business, to help her neighbors apply for the grants they needed to make it through. We know that community spirit isn't unique in our state, but Doris exemplifies the best of our small business owners. I had the op opportunity to reach out and thank Doris on Monday for her commitment to Garfield and her clients. I, I said, Doris, what's the best way if somebody wants to throw some business your way, what's the best way to get a hold of you? What's your website? She said, you know what? I've never had to rely on a website. It's all word of mouth, but I, I asked her if I could, with her permission, give the office number out, and she said she would. So DeVasquez uh, Tax Solutions um, in, in Garfield, their phone number is 973-779-6665, 973-779-6665. Thank you, Doris. And finally, for today, I want to talk about this guy. I must uh, thank and acknowledge our friend and colleague and the director of the Office of Homeland Security, Jared Maples. And sadly, with a, with a heavy heart, but also with, a, with great optimism for his future, that he will be leaving us to join the National Hockey League, as a, not, not as coach of the Devils, by the way, as executive vice president and chief security officer. For the past nearly four years, including for almost a year before I got here, Jared has committed himself to the safety and security of the people of New Jersey. He has led our ongoing counterterrorism and cybersecurity efforts and has been with us for all manner of emergency preparations. Throughout the pandemic, he and his office have been a critical link in our COVID response. I know that he will take the same professionalism and knowledge that has helped us protect the 9.3 million residents of New Jersey uh, to protect players, officials, staff, and millions of hockey fans in NHL arenas, 
across North America. So to you, Jared, we thank you. We congratulate you. And I look forward to seeing you next year when the New Jersey Devils raise the Stanley Cup. Otherwise, we're going to ask you to drop your gloves. Good luck, man. With that, let's turn things over to the state's epidemiologist. Please help me welcome Dr. Christina Tan. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. As the vaccination program continues, we are seeing coverage increase across age groups. 85% of those age 65 and older have received at least one dose of the vaccine. 68% of those 50 to 64 years um, old have received at least one dose of vaccine. 53% of those 30 to 49 have received at least one dose of vaccine. And 35% of those 16 to 29 years have received at least one dose. So vaccinations among that younger age group have been steadily rising since eligibility opened on April 19th. Partnering with the Office of the Secretary of Higher Education, the department held a call last week with the state's colleges and universities, enlisting their assistance in helping to inform and activate their students. As schools determine vaccine plans for their campuses, the department will work with schools to determine if they would like to host a vaccination site on campus or will help them identify specific times and opportunities at the mega sites or other community sites for their campuses to be vaccinated. If students get vaccinated here and need to return to their home state before receiving their second dose, they can talk to their health care provider or check in with the pharmacy chains that are providing vaccinations. So with the easing of some of the COVID-19 restrictions in place this month, and with the weather turning warmer, um, probably tomorrow, hopefully, um, we expect that more New Jerseyans will be out enjoying the outdoors. And with the warm weather, we will also see the emergence of ticks, which spread illness. May is Tick-Borne Disease Awareness Month. So while spending time outside, it is important to take steps to protect yourself. Lyme disease accounts for 82% of all tick-borne diseases, and there were more than 3,600 Lyme cases reported in our state in 2019. Um, as a reminder, you can reduce your risk by taking these actions to avoid tick bites. Avoid wooded areas with dense shrubs and leaf litter where ticks would like to hide. Make your yard less attractive to ticks by mowing lawns and trimming trees. Use EPA-registered repellent with DEET. Wear solid, light-colored clothing because this will make it easier to find a tick on your clothes. Tuck your pants into your socks and wear a long sleeve shirt. This will help prevent a tick from attaching to your skin. Keep your pets safe by checking for ticks daily and using tick control products as recommended by your veterinarian. And check yourself for ticks frequently after being outside in areas where ticks may live. So moving on to the department's daily report. Today, we are reporting a high number of antigen positives, as the governor had mentioned earlier, due to a reporting issue with a provider. The majority of today's antigen results are delayed reports um, because of that um, uh, delay in um, reporting. Of the 1,700 probable cases we are reporting today, 1,402 specimens were collected more than two weeks ago. And the reporting issue mainly affects Bergen County antigen cases. And about half the reports were collected in 2020 and the remainder were collected this year. There are 3,253 reports of CDC variants of concern in New Jersey, of which um, 2,998 of these reports are B117, um, also known as the um, variant that emerged out of the UK. Additionally, there are 104 reports of P1, the uh, variant emerging out of Brazil, seven reports of B1351, um, the variant emerging out of South Africa, and 144 reports of B1427 and B1429, uh, the variants that had uh, emerged out of California. We do not have new reports of multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. There are 116 cumulative cases in the state. At the state veterans' homes, there are no new cases among residents. And at the state psychiatric hospitals, there are no new cases among patients. For the, um, uh, as of May 1st, um, 2021, the daily percent positivity for um, the entire state is 6.87, um, as uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, in the northern region, 7.05%, central region, 6.03%, and um, southern region, 7.62%. That concludes the department's daily report. Please continue to practice 
practice public health precautions, mask up, physically distance, stay home when you're sick, get tested, and get vaccinated. And if you're spending time outdoors, take steps to protect you and your family from tick bites. Tina, thank you. And the tick uh, awareness point is another good example of notwithstanding an overwhelming pandemic with an overwhelming loss of life, again, akin to a war and then some, life goes on. Other public health challenges remain or there. Other pieces of government remain in motion. And we have to, you know, and we've had to, from day one, balance the fact that we're all in all the time on a pandemic, but other stuff matters. So thank you for that reminder. Great to be with you. Pat, um, we could use a little bit better weather. Uh, it also, by the way, the next few days as we roll into Mother's Day does not exactly look like it's balmy, but it gets better, right? Um, how are we doing there? Anything on compliance? Any other words of wisdom? Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, there were no executive order compliance violations reported to the ROC since we last met. Yeah, rain uh, certainly today, Gov. I think it's going to be beautiful tomorrow. So uh, easing into Mother's Day weekend. Uh, and if I can, too, just add to your remarks, Governor, uh, the NHL has made a phenomenal pick. Um, what a lot of people may not know is Director Maples plays on the state police hockey team. Uh, and I think that fact, uh, coupled with the fact that he could quote any line from Slapshot, probably sealed the deal. Um, but moreover, he's been a phenomenal teammate in our collective efforts to keep those in New Jersey safe uh, from a homeland security standpoint, from a preparedness standpoint. Uh, and I'm honored and humbled for our partnership, uh, but more so for our friendship. So best of luck to you, Director, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch. God bless. Thanks, Gov. Well said. Amen to all. Paul Newman in heaven is looking down, giving you a wink, uh, having lost, I think, as I recall, most of his teeth in that movie. So well done. We'll start over here before we uh, do, just to say that I think we're going to stay on the rhythm that we've been on of late, which is we'll be, I think I'm on the road tomorrow somewhere up north, and hopefully we'll do it at a time where we've got some COVID um, updates for you. Uh, and we will likely be on the road. I know I've got at least one vaccination visit on Friday, um, and we'll, we'll keep you posted, but we'll probably stay in the same mode and then be back here again on Monday, same time, same place. So with that, Matt, we get Brent is up, up to bat. Hello, all. Um, what, what do you, you may have mentioned this the other day, but I might have missed it. What do, what do you think about keeping the smoking ban on at casinos? Governor Cuomo just announced New York will allow vaccinated people to sit in non-socially distant sections at sports stadiums. Would New Jersey consider the same? Uh, people are again having issues claiming unemployment benefits this time because programming didn't capture claimants when the state triggered off high extended benefits to transition them to another program. Will these issues keep happening every time uh, benefit programs change? And why isn't the DOL communicating how long it will take to resolve? You have a bill on your desk that would form the Government Efficiency and Reg Regulatory Review Commission. Will you sign it? And if not, why? And last one from Karen Yee of WNYC. How many primary care doctors will receive vaccines from the mega sites as part of the hub and spoke program and when? Why did it take so long for primary care doctors to play a role in the vaccination program? Um, I've got, I, I don't think I, I, I was asked about the smoking ban on Monday and I don't think I answered it, right? Did you ask it? Yeah, someone else did. I, I forgot to answer. I've, I've not developed a view on that. Um, so I don't, I don't have a, an answer for you. Um, no comment on New York, but these are, listen, we will get to the point, I hope sooner than later, where we're, we're going to continue to take steps here, assuming we can achieve our objectives. And so I think folks should assume basically everything is on the table uh, and between today and complete normalcy. The question is really what and when. Um, Unemployment insurance benefits, I've got no color on that, but I know my friend Rob Angelo, and I suspect he's watching. So if I get an answer, I will come back to you personally from this microphone. Otherwise, Mahan, will you follow up with Brent um, and, and, uh, and come up to you? Uh, I have no comment on, 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 the, on the bill. Obviously, we make a decision on, on signing. We will let you know. I don't know how many primary care doctors have been vaccinated. We can come back to you with that if that exists. But if the question was, why didn't we do some of this stuff before? I'm going to go back to the war analogy. Uh, forgive me to those who don't like this. When you're in a war, 
it, things evolve. You, 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 you have beach land, whatever the heck it might be. And that's what we're doing. And, and this is a question we always knew, as I've mentioned now for a couple of weeks, that we would get to the place where the supply demand imbalance would swing the other way and that it would require us to shift strategy and to be very offensive getting into communities any variety, homebound I mentioned today, young people who are going to go to a brewery to, to, to pick two examples. Um, and so th these are steps that, you know, at the right time and the right place, we always knew we would, we would take. And so that explains the timing. I don't have the numbers, but we can, we'll, if, if that number exists, Mahan and Tina will help me figure out uh, when to get back to you. I've got nothing on unemployment insurance yet, but if I do get it, I'll come back to you. Otherwise, we will follow up offline. Thank you. Alex, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Governor, have you spoken recently to Governor Wolf in Pennsylvania? He made a major reopening announcement, I believe it was yesterday, including that if 70% of the 18 and over population in Pennsylvania is vaccinated, he will lift the mask requirement. What do you think of that? Is that something so that- I missed that. The what percent of what? 70% of the adult population of Pennsylvania. If they're vaccinated, Governor Wolf has said he will lift the mask mandate. Okay. Is that something you might consider? And additionally, on Pennsylvania, they've been at indoor dining at 75% since Easter. And even though they're, they're larger than us, they had about triple the new cases of COVID on May 3rd, and they have more people in the hospital and on ventilators. Is Governor Wolf being irresponsible in moving this quickly, or is he simply moving more quickly than you would? I also want to ask about large venues. I think you mentioned this on Monday, but is there more clear guidance on when conventions could begin in places like Atlantic City? like to ask the colonel, when was the last time that someone received a citation for violating the outdoor mask mandate? And if that number is low or zero, why is there a mandate that's not being enforced? And I had one question for uh, Dr. Tan, just in general. Um, I just want to be clear about the antigen numbers that you announced today. How exactly did that happen? Was it an error in Bergen County? And if you said there's 2,650 and 1,400 today are out of that 2,650, when should we expect to see the other antigens reflected in the data? Okay, first of all, Brent, this is what um, Rob has come to me with. Um, he's not 100% sure what the topic is that you're referring to. There was an issue um, with a population for two to three days early last week. It was all fixed, and they were able to certify later in the week. Um, but beyond that, I still think, Mahan, it makes sense to connect. Um, if that's okay, Brent, with you, we'll follow up offline. Um, Alex, apologies, we'll get to yours here. Give me one sec. Um, I can't remember the last time I spoke to Governor Wolf. We, we speak generally regularly. It has not been lately, but our teams and chiefs in particular speak literally all the time. And that, that chief, even when I'm not speaking principal to principal, the chiefs in particular uh, and commissioners of health speak regularly. Uh, I'm not just going to say daily, but they speak a lot with our neighboring um, counterparts. Um, listen, uh, uh, the indoor mask mandate continues to be, for me, a, um, a big step. So we're not there yet. Will we, will we be able to take that step at some point? Yes. Whether it will be because we achieve 70%, to, uh, I, I, I can't give you a crisp answer on that. Um, I, I, don't have a, I don't have insight as to why his cases are up, honestly. Um, we decided not to go to that 50 to up to 75% uh, step because it was quite clear that both bar seating, which we, which we are now allowing as of Friday, that lack of that was shrinking the denominator. And secondly, the six foot CDC rule, those are the two that bite the most. So I've, I got no, um, no color on their situation. Obviously we hope that they, I think he's a terrific leader and I hope they get through their challenges as, as I hope we do as well. So the, the, the uh, Paramel will, will, will help me out here. The, the, we're not saying anything but yes to conventions, but there, there are capacity limits. So it's going to go up to 250 persons per room. Is that this Friday or, or the 19th? That's on May 19th. May 19th. So that's two weeks from today. Uh, but I, I did mention the other day the, the concept that that's 250 per room and Atlantic City's got some very large rooms and it also has fixed seating theaters. I know at least two, Hard Rock, Ocean, 
which have a very large footprint, and we're allowing 30 percent of those seats to be filled effective the same day. So you could you the answer is it's not a binary yes no. It's a, it's really the scale of the convention. I hope that we can get again. We, we're on we're on a journey. We keep getting people vaccinated. Our health numbers keep going the right direction. We're going to keep being able to open things up. And then the last two questions are for my colleagues. I, I, I have no idea the last day we did a mask out, outdoor mask mandate, but that doesn't mean just because Pat isn't doing it that local authorities are not doing it. It's much more likely that a, a local police department would be making that move, I would assume, Pat, or in your case, where you all do the, you, you step in and do the shoes of the local policing. And then, Tina, any more color on the test? Pat. I'll just, and I, I, I could go back and check that, Alex. There's been about 4,000 EO noncompliance reports uh, since we started with the executive orders. Uh, over 400 of them have been indictables, so that would exclude the outdoor mask, and about 3,600 fall into that. But um, I could circle back with you and get you that number, but to give you a ballpark, that's we're looking at about 4,000 violations since this began. And that could be for any number of things. Capacity, I think, we're probably the most. And again, on outdoor masking, I just want to make sure we re reiterate if somebody's watching for the first time, from the moment we put these in place on the outdoors side of this, you need to wear a mask outside if you cannot socially distance. If you can, you do not need to wear it. That's, that, is, that has been the case from day one, and that does not have any caveat as to whether you're vaccinated or not. That's, that's the rule of the road in New Jersey. It has been um, uh, from day one. Tina. So um, these new files that we got, um, they all came from a uh, healthcare provider group up in Bergen County. And um, uh, so when we actually started, you know, kind of shaking out all these uh, different files, some of those files, uh, some of those positive antigen tests uh, created new cases, uh, new probable cases, while uh, the remainder of those antigen tests were attached to existing um, probable cases or, you know, some confirmed cases um, that already existed in our system. You know, we're still kind of shaking out the numbers right now, but we anticipate that from the um, antigen um, results that were reported today, um, probably about um, 300 of those are actually are uh, not from that uh, file, that lump of files that came to us from this one particular provider. Oh no, they, um, when, the, when the result comes in, you know, we get, we're not the ones that um, are necessarily uh, the first uh, receipt of um, these um, uh, results. These are reports, uh, these are lab results that are um, ordered from healthcare providers who actually are the ones who are doing the, you know, the follow-up, the clinical uh, care of these particular patients. We're, we're counting these individuals uh, for our um, surveillance purposes. Thank you. Okay, you're good. Sir, you got any? Yes, I do. Get yourself focused. Afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon. Um, I have a few on vaccines. Um, what is the state plan for closing vaccine sites like Essex County is doing? Uh, how is your distribution plan impacted by closures and declining demand? And can it respond to these changes quickly enough? And can we get numbers on vaccine loss or waste? And what steps are you taking to reduce this loss? And on schools, uh, what plans, if any, does the state have for encouraging additional summer programs in public schools to help kids catch up who are suffering from learning loss? Yeah, I, I, I would say the first two questions, um, impact of, sorry, uh, any observations on closed sites and then the impact that that will have similar answer to the question that Brett asked on behalf of someone else. I forget who it was on behalf of, but, you know, what primary care doctors, why now? This is all, I think you saw President Biden, frankly, talking yesterday in a similar mode to what we were talking on Monday with the hub and spoke um, uh, approach. So this is basically going to get very localized is the best way to put it. I assume that we'll continue to have some big sites where folks can go because they're, they're so well run and so efficient, but this is going to be increasingly localized, community specific, um, get into, you know, get into all the crevices and corners of the state. Um, and that's, that was our intention all along and we knew it would, would uh, come upon us. I don't have any update on vaccine loss or waste other than it's very low, but we can follow up with you unless you've got something off the top of your head. We'll come back to you. But I, our folks 
have, remember, we are in the top handful of American states on the efficiency of getting doses into people's arms, and that does not happen. You're not at that level, particularly among big states where we're invariably by ourselves on that top 10 list. That doesn't happen if you've got a lot of waste. So will we mind if you can help me follow up. And I, I, don't, I don't think there's one answer on schools. You'll recall that, that we put a lot of CRFs, Corona Relief uh, Funds, to work, which we announced a couple of months ago, uh, that we distributed a lot of money, a lot of it per capita, but with specific, two specific programs on mental health uh, recovery and, and remediation, as well as learning loss. And there's a lot of flexibility in that money, and as I believe there will be in prospective money, we still don't have the guidance from the feds and the American Rescue Plan money, but I, my gut tells me that's coming soon here. Um, and so that'll be, you know, those are decisions that Department of Education will likely have guidance, but those are going to be district, district specific in many respects. Probably uh, Mahan makes sense to get Angelica back here at some point uh, in the next couple of weeks just to give maybe a sense of what, how she sees the balance of the school year and also what summer programs might, might look like. But take, for instance, one of the communities where I said that they, they still do not, there are three communities left, three districts that don't have yet uh, a reopening plan. That, the summer plan for a district like that is probably dramatically different than a district that's been hybrid from day one or all in person from day one. So it's going to be, I think, a, a localized, not, not one size fits all answer. Thank you. Dave, good afternoon. Hi, Governor. Um, you're no doubt aware that many businesses in New Jersey are having a lot of problems, a lot of difficulty finding workers. It's become clear that some people, not all, but some are collecting unemployment. Uh, they're making more than they would if they were working, especially menial jobs, so they're not really trying to find work, if we can be honest here. Um, with the expanded state reopening fast approaching, what's your sense about how this is going to play out? How will it affect, especially these smaller mom and pop businesses where the profit margin is razor thin? Um, what's your feeling about reinstating the actively searching for work requirement of listing businesses specifically in order to collect UI? The governor of New Hampshire, as you might be aware, just reinstated this requirement because they're having the same worker shortage situation that we're facing here in New Jersey. And would you consider ending the $300 extra dollar a week federal unemployment bonus coverage like the governor of Nevada just did to encourage people to look for employment more assiduously? Um, if at the end of the summer, governor, we're doing great, and uh, then all of a sudden in the fall, COVID starts to come back and Pfizer and Moderna start to roll out their booster shots, will we still be using the mega site idea to accomplish this? I know this is looking off several months in the future, but I'm sure you guys have brainstormed about what may happen because you've been right on top of this stuff from the get-go. Um, do you envision the same kind of situation where it would be mega sites and county sites doing this and, and how easily or di more difficultly would it, how difficult would it be to re-establish these sites? And finally, with regard to the shots and a beer program, would you consider allowing reporters previously vaccinated to qualify for this <laughs> program? Thank you. I think that's a brilliant idea. Only if we can include everybody uh, in uh, this uh, hallway, including Matt, who's holding the microphone, Jared, maybe on your way out the door, Paramel, Pat, Tina, and me. So, um, I, I love the way you're thinking, Dave. Um, on workers, listen, this is not the first time this has come up. This comes up pretty regularly, and we hear it from friends of ours who are largely in the restaurant business, but you hear it at restaurant bars, small businesses, as you point out. Um, a couple of reactions. The overwhelming number of folks who have been unemployed um, and have been impacted by this pandemic have suffered greatly. So that's the fact. I'm not, I'm not denying the, the anecdotal or even more than anecdotal evidence that 
folks are having a hard time f hiring people because we hear it regularly ourselves. But the overwhelming amount of folks who have been hit economically, and particularly with job loss in this pandemic, have suffered enormously. And so the benefits overwhelmingly are needed for them and for their families. Secondly, it's, it's, it's a passing reality. This is not going to be the case forever. This, these benefits are not forever and always. Um, and so it is a temporary, I'm not suggesting it, it is not real, but it is, I believe, temporary. Um, I saw my friend, I have not spoken to him, but I saw my friend Tim McClune, who owns 10 New Jersey restaurants, and I think, if I read the article right, is, has plans to open three more this summer, uh, which is good for him uh, in the face of all this. Um, he is going to pay all non-tip, according to this article, all non-tipped employees $15 an hour. So my sense is that that's probably one way that folks will get around this, and my guess is, in fairness, they'll probably pass that on. Um, so the burger is gonna be an extra 50 cents or 75 cents, whatever it might be, and that's probably a reality right now. Some amount of inflation feels inevitable. Um, we've had no plans to institute either the prove to us you're looking for work, uh, or do we have any plans, and, and I know that we won't pulling the 300. I, I didn't see that Nevada had done that. That, 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 no plans to do either of those. Um, but again, I'll defer to Rob Sarah Angelo and his team uh, on, on, on particularly that question about requiring you to prove that you're looking for work. But I, I think our evidence is overwhelmingly people are doing the right thing and they've suffered dramatically. And again, small businesses, let's reiterate and stipulate, have been crushed. Um, and, again, and when we get the American Rescue Plan guidance, a lot of that money is going to go into restaurants, bars, hospitality, small businesses. And that's one other answer to this challenge right now. Um, on schools, I don't have a crisp answer for you. Um, not on schools, pardon me, but on mega sites when we get back to school in the fall if this thing rears its head again. First of all, Tina, I'm hoping against hope uh, that it doesn't rear, rear its head again, at least in a meaningful way, particularly given the vaccine levels that I'm sure that we're going to get to. Uh, but I think I've said this a number of times, we will leave either literally or with short notice a lot of our distribution infrastructure in place. Um, and that's going to be a, a broader, more complicated reality than when I said it a couple of months ago, because that infrastructure now will include a much more, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, a much more localized element to it. I would bet, and again, please God, we don't have to go through this, but we could be, you know, as we've said many times, it could be the flu shot. It could be that every October, as I get my flu shot, you're getting, you're getting um, uh, a, a COVID uh, booster. Um, if it is, my guess is it will be at least in the near term and both, meaning it will be mega sites because they can do such scale so efficiently and so quickly. But when I get my COVID, uh, my flu shot, rather, I go to a Walgreens. I call up, make an appointment, I show up and get that. So my guess is it's, it's going to be, and both, it's going to be the big sort of hubs as well as a lot of the localized places that, um, that, we, um, that we are now getting to in, in much more of a scale. With that, I'm going to put this bracelet on, given to me by a retired trooper. Is it Billy Trump? Yes, sir. Billy Trump, no relation to the president. Okay. <laughs> um, a really cool bracelet. This is another... Reminder, we were together, Jared was with us, with Pat and myself and others at the Survivors of the Triangle, very solemn um, annual event on Monday. And I might add, and we, by the way, we were at the Blue Mass yesterday, uh, back to back, remembering in a different way, in this case at the cathedral in Patterson with Bishop Sweeney, uh, remembering those lost in the line of duty, uh, as well as their families. So. Billy Trump, if you're watching, I'm wearing this with pride here. <laughs> Tina, thank you, as always, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you back here, as we always do. I'm going to mask up. Pat, thank you. Jared, best of luck. Make sure you ensure the Devils win the Cup. Sooner is better than later. Paramel, Mahan, Matt, the rest of the team. Keep at it, folks. Keep doing what you're doing, slowly but surely. We're getting there. Mahan, if my math is right, yesterday we, we had a big vaccination day. So the past few days have been modest. Yesterday, I think we had 38,000 
first doses, which is huge. And I suspect it's not unrelated uh, to the fact that we've dropped the hammer. Um, so let's keep that up, folks. Get vaccinated. Uh, keep doing the right things. We're going to continue to open the state up. We got a lot of stuff happening on Friday, including dance floors for proms and bar seating in restaurants, um, among other steps. So stay strong and God bless.